Welcome to Communism in the World, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation series dedicated to telling the true story of communist ideology, its history of political implementation, and the legacy of Marxist political economy. I'm Murray Bissett, Director of Academic Programs, and I'm pleased to present to you today Dr. Alexander Motil, a professor of political science at Rutgers University, Newark, and a novelist, poet, and painter. A specialist on Ukraine, Russia, and the Soviet Union, he is the author of nine academic books, including Ukraine versus Russia, Revolution, Democracy, and War. Together with Bodan Klid, he is the editor of the Holodomor Reader, a source book on the famine of 1932 to 1933 in Ukraine, an invaluable resource for educators and lay people alike. You can learn more about his work, including his novels, poems, and artworks, by visiting his public Facebook page. We are truly privileged to have Alex here with us today to share his unparalleled knowledge of the Holodomor. Following his presentation, we will have a discussion drawing upon questions submitted by the audience. You can submit questions for Alex throughout the event using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And with that, Alex, I welcome you and I invite you to share your presentation. Yes, am I here? Oh. Yes, we, we can hear you <laughs> and we see you. Now you can see me, thank you. Thank you so much, Murray, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you as well to the foundation for having me here. Um, I will try to be as brief as I was instructed to be. So I'll try to keep my remarks to about 20, 25 minutes and that will give us time for whatever discussion you'd like to engage in. Um, had I been speaking to you about 40, 45 or so years ago, um, and I shudder to think that I can actually remember that period very distinctly, um, my talk would have been very different. At that point in time, the very notion of a great famine that had led to millions of victims in Ukraine in the 19, early 1930s was still a matter of some controversy. A significant portion of the academic world wasn't sure that it had taken place. Um, of course, the Soviets denied that any such thing had ever occurred uh, to the degree that some people agreed that some kind of victimization, some sort of atrocity had indeed taken place in Ukraine. Most academics in the non-Ukrainian field, but in Sovietology would have said, well, it might have been several thousand, perhaps a few tens of thousands victims. Um, and certainly no one would have referred to whatever had taken place at this point in time as a genocide. Uh, the numbers were certainly too small and, if, and to the degree that they existed at all. Because as I said, there was a persuasion, there was a conviction on the part of a significant number of the academic community in the West, and obviously in the Soviet Union, that nothing terribly dramatic had taken place. Um, this despite the fact that a very large number of Ukrainian political emigres who had lived through, survived, or witnessed the famine, had written about it, had testified about it, um, but their testimony was largely ignored because they were anti-communist, because they were East Europeans, uh, because they were therefore untrustworthy. And we're presumably exaggerating and not quite telling the truth. Um, that began changing, as I said, that kind of consensus, the consensus that there wasn't much to talk about, began changing roughly 40 years ago, you know, maybe 35, maybe 45, but say roughly 40 or so years ago, uh, to the degree that by now, each of those three points that I had mentioned, the non-existence of a famine, a very small number of uh, victims, and the non-genocidal nature of whatever happened to transpire in Ukraine at that time, all of those issues have been resolved in one fashion, in one fashion or other. And there is indeed something in the nature of a consensus. Um, that change transpired as a result of some significant efforts done by uh, academics. They were a handful, but there were some academics in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe who were writing about the famine, increasingly writing about the famine, and uh, getting their, you know, the information out to the world. 
Uh, possibly the most important turning point occurred in the 1980s uh, when Robert Conquest, the highly respected uh, specialist on Stalinism in the period of the 1930s, uh, wrote a book called Harvest of Despair, in which he, for the first time, in a magisterial academic scholarly fashion, wrote about the famine and brought it to the attention of the scholarly world. And inasmuch as conquest was neither a Slav nor Ukrainian nor Russian, his testimony, his arguments were deemed to be objective. And that book became a turning point, as I said, in the perceptions of many academics towards the famine. In any case, at this point in time, uh, there is no dispute anymore among serious academics, both in the, so in the former Soviet Union, or at least in much of the former Soviet Union, and certainly in the West, about the fact that a terrible event transpired in Ukraine in 1932 and 1933. Uh, no one disputes that there was a massive famine um, that resulted from uh, the Soviet policy of collectivization and the attendant repressive measures that the Soviet regime adopted to punish Ukrainians for their malfeasance in the early part of the 1920s, as well as in towards the late 1920s, early 1930s. I can talk more about that in the Q&A if that's of interest to you. In any case, no one disputes the fact that a famine took place. No one disputes the fact that millions seem to have been affected. There is still some controversy over the numbers. Uh, until recently, much of the numbers debate centered on projections based on uncertain Soviet censuses conducted in the 1930s, and the number of dead could have ranged from 2 million to 12 million. Um, which again is still in the millions, but as you can see, the mere fact that there was such a huge range suggested that there was uncertainty in terms of the methodology. Uh, in recent studies conducted by American demographers together with Ukrainian demographers based on actual primary sources that were, con that were uh, uh, contained in Ukrainian archives, uh, they came up with the number 3.9 or 4 million of dead in Ukraine between December of 1932 and May, June of 1933. Uh, that number may conceivably be higher. That does not include the number of Ukrainians that may have been affected by the famine or by collectivization outside of the borders of Soviet Ukraine. And if you include those, the number may increase by a few hundred thousand or possibly even by a few million. But we can say with complete certainty that there is at least four million dead peasants, dead Ukrainian peasants, um, in the period between December of 1932 and May, June of 1933. Um, at the high point of the famine in the spring of 1933, roughly 30,000 peasants were dying on a daily basis. And if you simply calculate the, and I apologize for the ghastly term, the kill ratio, uh, it comes out to roughly 700,000 people who were killed in the course of a month. That is to say, you divide those 4 million by six months and you get roughly 700,000, just under 700,000. Uh, just as a point of comparison, remember that the Holocaust, which lasted roughly from 1939 until 1945, that is to say about six or so years, and resulted in six million dead, uh, there the kill ratio is one million in a year, in 12 months. So the the pace of ex uh, extermination, uh, the degree to which Ukrainian peasants were dying with enormous alacrity uh, is striking. I mean, it's significantly higher than what we encounter even in the Holocaust, even in the Holocaust. Um, there is still, as I said, some dispute about the exact numbers, but we can say, as I said, with certainty that it was at least 4 million. Um, the next issue that, as I said, is, uh, has been to a large degree resolved, but not quite completely, is the question of whether these deaths, whether the famine was intentional, was it an intentional killing, was it an intentional extermination, 
of the Ukrainian peasantry or not. That is to say, was it a genocide or was it not a genocide? 40, 45 years ago, this question would not have even arisen. Um, most scholars would not have talked about genocide in these particular terms. Now, of course, genocide studies have acquired a life of their own. And it's not surprising that many people who specialize in the Holdemore have been asking, well, is this particular extermination of peasants, was it a genocide? Um, and here the consensus, it's not unanimity, but, I, but certainly the consensus, my sense is it's easily 75% of serious scholars dealing with the 1930s or dealing with the Holodomor in particular, whether in Ukraine specifically or whether in Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union more generally. In any case, a significant portion of these scholars, maybe three quarters, maybe more, maybe a little less, would agree that this was indeed a genocide. And if you have the opportunity to read Anne Applebaum's wonderful book you'll know, uh, called uh, The Red Famine, you'll notice that she refers to it as a genocide as well. Uh, the issue is still of some contention um, because it largely focuses on the question of intent. And as in the case of many other genocides, it's hard to come up with a smoking gun. That is to say a decree by Stalin in which he says, go kill Ukrainians. Uh, quite. The contrary, there is no such decree, but based on the kinds of argumentation and the policies that were adopted by the Soviet regime in late 1932 and early 1933, policies relating to the intentional increase of quotas for Ukrainian peasantry, for the Ukrainian peasantry, even as it was known that increasing grain quotas would lead to an intensification of the famine. And then when the intensification of the famine occurred and peasants started dying as flies, rather than assisting the peasantry, the Soviet regime blocked off villages and blocked off Ukraine, thereby forcing peasants to remain in their starving villages and thereby face an almost certain death. So it's that combination of events, those policies that I think, and certainly most people would argue, uh, accounts for the intent and thereby qualifies this particular event as a genocide. Um, another factor for the, another argument for the genocide perspective is the fact that as the Holodomor is taking place, so again, roughly end of 32, middle of 1933, the Soviet regime embarks on a full scale assault on the Soviet Ukrainian intelligentsia, the Soviet Ukrainian political elite, that is to say the members of the Communist Party and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. That crackdown plus the Holodomor, the famine that was imposed on the Ukrainian peasantry, led Raphael Lemkin, whom I assume you've heard of, the uh, well-known uh, Jewish-Polish scholar who actually coined the term genocide and played a key role in the formulation of the Genocide Convention in the, late, in the mid to late 1940s. That led him to the conclusion in the early 1950s that Ukraine was indeed a classic example of genocide, precisely because you had a crackdown on the political, economic, um, uh, religious, cultural elites, as well as on the body of the nation, which is to say the peasantry. So when you take all those factors together, uh, you begin to see that it wasn't simply a question of defanging, eliminating a significant portion of the population, namely the peasantry. It was really about destroying the nation almost in its entirety. The nation physically, but the nation culturally, intellectually, as well as politically. Um, so the arguments for genocide, to my mind, are fairly clear. As I said, not everyone quite agrees. Um, some people still point out to the lack of a smoking gun. Uh, they're not quite persuaded that the context matters as much. Uh, but if you look at the trend line over the last, say, 30, 40 years, when f so for 40 years ago, virtually no one considered the famine, the whole Demur, to be a genocide. 
Uh, and now in comparison, the number is say two thirds, three quarters, perhaps even more of the specialist community, then the trend line is certainly going upwards. And even if it remains a three quarters, that will serve to create something in the nature of a consensus that will uh, affect the way in which we perceive the Soviet Union, Stalinism and the like. Um, what are some of the lessons of the famine? Uh, and by the way, if you have any additional questions or if you have any questions about the actual mechanics of the famine, more about the nature of the losses, uh, things of that sort, we can talk about them later on. But as I said, I, I'll try to be as brief as I can so as to give you the opportunity to express your own concerns and interests. Uh, what are some of the key lessons of the famine? Um, and, and they are, they're mixed. <laughs> and so let me start with the, um, the saddest lessons. And, th and that is that um, if you look at the response on the part of the world, and more importantly, more specifically, the West, that is to say Europe, the United States, Canada, uh, we discover that A, they actually knew about the famine in 1933 and 1934. Uh, there are a whole bunch of documents that were written by diplomats, by journalists in this period of time, uh, very accurately documenting the famine, the extent of the losses. In those days, the losses actually were often estimated at being six to 10 million. Uh, so it's not as if there was lack of knowledge. I mean, the knowledge may have seeped up, may not have seeped up to the highest levels of political authority in Western countries, but th certainly the famine was known to many people. That said, it was largely ignored. Uh, it was largely ignored for some valid reasons. Remember in 1933, in March of 1933, uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis come to power in Germany and the attention of many countries shifts from whatever it is that they were focusing on before that uh, to the potential Nazi threat. Uh, there are also less legitimate reasons, namely the desire to normalize relations with the Soviet Union, resume economic and political ties. And that of course bespeaks a willingness on the part of countries in general, even democratic countries in particular, to turn a blind eye to atrocities if it suits their geopolitical, strategic, economic, and other kinds of interests. None of that is terribly unusual. We find that kind of behavior in history since time immemorial. We find that in contemporary history as well. Um, but it is something that we need to recognize that when push comes to shove, many countries, even many well-meaning countries, even many well-meaning countries with a commitment to something called human rights, will look the other way if that's inconvenient, if recognizing the degree of atrocities being committed is somehow inconvenient for them, somehow threatens their economic, political, or other uh, positions. Um, that's, if you like, the bad news. Um, it's also bad, of course, that when one considers the response of many non-governmental Western intellectuals in Western Europe and the United States into the famine at this point in time in the 1930s, uh, one encounters the argument used, by the way, by the New York Times correspondent in Moscow at that time, Walter Duranti, who knew of the famine and then denied it. Um, so it's not as if he was misled, he knew what was going on, but argued, as did many other intellectuals, as met, did many people, especially on the left in the 1930s, that you can't make an omelet without breaking gags. And those were indeed the terms, the words that these people used. Um, that too is unfortunate. And it suggests a willingness on the part of a significant portion of the intellectual elite. And I'm obviously counting uh, Duranti in that intellectual elite, uh, but it obviously bespeaks a willingness on the part of intellectuals in general, perhaps, certainly on the part of intellectuals, left-oriented intellectuals in Europe and the United States in the 1930s in particular, to delude themselves. Uh, this kind of self-delusion, unfortunately, especially when it comes to communism, is not unusual. 
Uh, it's been written about very extensively and it survives arguably to this day, less with regard to communist regimes, more with regard to dictatorships that promise to do things of some kind or other. Um, but the case of the 1930s is especially striking because people, academics, intellectuals, not just in Western Europe, but also those in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union would oftentimes bend over backwards in order to justify the activities of what they knew was a criminal regime. And as you know, Arthur Kessler wrote about this in his magnificent novel, uh, Darkness at Noon. The, uh, famous uh, Polish poet as well as philosopher Czesław Miłosz wrote, that, wrote about that in the 1950s in a remarkable book called The Captive Mind. And in his case, the mind that is captive is the mind of intellectuals who were willing to delude themselves for the sake of some ostensibly larger cause. Anyway, that's the bad news. Um, the willingness on the part of the world to ignore atrocities, the willingness on, on the part of intellectuals in general and certain intellectuals in particular to justify atrocities. Um, the semi good news is that mass atrocities of the, such, such as the Holodomor, such as the Holocaust, uh, and I, I don't mean to downplay any kind of atrocities, but here we're talking about millions upon millions being killed. Uh, they seem to be largely, not exclusively, but largely the handiwork of totalitarian regimes. Um, that is to say, not only communist regimes, the communists, of course, um, hold first place in general when it comes to committing atrocities of any kind. But in the case of the Holocaust, of course, we're talking about the atrocities committed by the Nazi totalitarian regimes. Um, so the two, two of the most uh, costly in human lives, uh, genocides in the 20th century were, of course, as I said, both the Holocaust and the Holodomor, and both were committed by totalitarian regimes. Um, why is that good news? It's, well, again, why is it semi good news? It would be good news if they were the only ones who did this, but as we know from experience, it is often the case that even democratic regimes can behave and can misbehave rather in ways that entail violations of human rights, violations of uh, life, quite simply of life. That said, I think it still stands the test of history to say that totalitarian regimes in general and communist totalitarian regimes in particular are the ones that are most inclined to engage in this kind of behavior for obvious reasons. Uh, on the one hand, they totally control everything and they really do, which gives them the ability to enact destruction upon whomever they want to. And at the same time, they're always driven by these radical utopian ideologies, which give them a motivation for bringing about the kinds of radical changes that they then have the capacity to bring about. Um, so the Nazis wanted to eliminate the Jews, and they did. The Soviets wanted to eliminate Ukrainians, and they did. Um, and of course, many communists and other regimes have decided that they want to do the same with their own recalcitrant minorities, and very often they've done the same as well. Anyway, why is this semi-good news? Uh, um, the only reason I'm a little bit optimistic here is because it does suggest a potential strategy for reducing the likelihood of genocide in general and atrocities, mass atrocities in particular, or rather mass atrocities in general and genocides in particular. Um, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but it seems to me that the solution um, in general, with some exceptions, is quite simply democracy. Uh, democratic regimes have done bad things, uh, but they do with them far less frequently. And when they do them, they generally don't do them as viciously. Um, as you know, some people even say that democracies don't fight wars. There's certainly some, there's certainly a lot of evidence for that too. Again, I don't want to say that I, democracies are the solution to all of humanity's ills, but it, there does seem to be something in the, case, in, in the claim that democracies do better in terms of human rights, do better in terms of atrocities as well as, certainly as well as genocides than do totalitarian and authoritarian regimes. Uh, that doesn't mean that creating democracies is necessarily an easy task. As we know, it's not. 
it's complicated. There are all sorts of zigs and zags, forward movement, backward movement. But it does suggest, this, this argument does suggest that there is a way, that there is indeed a way that one can eliminate or at least reduce the possibility of mass atrocities and genocides in the future. And that is by patiently, um, devotedly building democracy and retaining those democracies that exist and building democracies in those countries that do not exist. Uh, one has to be prepared for the long run. One has to be prepared for setbacks. Um, but it does seem to be the case that with, well, you know, by, by turning up your sleeves and by applying oneself, it uh, does seem possible to make democracies more likely in the world more widespread in the world, and as a result, to reduce the likelihood and to reduce the frequency and viciousness of the mass atrocities that, alas, are likely to occur regardless of our best efforts. But even reducing that likelihood, uh, reducing the probability, is certainly something to be striven for. Um, it's not perfection, it's short of perfection. Um, but as we know, um, even being short of perfection on this particular score is enormous, is, an, is already an enormous achievement and is certainly something worth striving for. I thank you for your attention and would be happy to entertain whichever questions and comments you have. Thank you again. Thank you, Alex, for an incredibly wide ranging, informative presentation. Before we turn to some of the questions attendees have already sent in, I want to remind those in attendance that you can submit your questions for Alex via the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, now, I always like to kick things off by asking a question pertinent for our educators in the audience. Uh, what general advice do you have for them about teaching about the Holodomor? Uh, and following on that, in terms of primary resources, what would you consider to be you know, the, the couple essential readings uh, for middle school and high school students to begin to grasp this. And it, of course, there's the whole Holodomor reader that I want to draw our attendees' uh, attention to, uh, but just a, a couple. The, let me start with the second point, um, and then, and then we'll, I'll come back to the first point, namely the <laughs> And you'll have to remind me what your first question was because I've already forgotten it. Uh, but in any case, in terms of the resources, uh, cr clearly the reader is a good start. But the excerpts from books were written by academics and academies, and they are likely to be somewhat of a turnoff for middle school students. Um, that said, the book contains a large number of survivor testimonies. It contains a fairly large number, something like 15 excerpts from poems, literature, novels, plays, things of that sort. And those would be just right for a general audience, especially for students, you know, in their mid to late teens, they're about. They'll be able to comprehend that, they'll be able to appreciate what is going on. Um, there's also a publication that is slated to come out within the next few months. It's being published in Kiev, in Ukraine, by the uh, National Institute of Historical Memory. And it's a translation of a very short memoir. It's only about 50 pages, uh, of a, written by a woman who was about 10, 11, 12 years old during the whole Demore. She wrote this in the late 70s, early 80s. And the whole memoir is written from a child's perspective. And in a way, it, it's kind of the Ukrainian equivalent of Anne Frank's diary. Uh, it's, it employs very simple language. There is no, no highfalutin jargon of any kind. Um, it's straightforward. She talks about daily events, daily things, her mother, her father, his, her sister, her brothers, what they ate, what they didn't eat, how they managed, how they tried, how they failed to survive, and so on. And it's the kind of book that could be read by an academic with a PhD, but it's also the sort of book that can easily be read and appreciated by 
a middle or high school student uh, without that academic background. And the story is compelling. Um, in any case, the, the novel, the, not the novel, excuse me, the memoir is called Speak of the Happy Life. And the author's name is Anastasia Lysivets. That's L-Y-S-Y-V-E-T-S. Um, and as I said, I would highly recommend that in conjunction with some of the other materials that are found in the Holodomor Reader. And you will have to remind me about the first question. Uh, you kind of were touching on it already. Uh, that is advice on how to approach teaching. Uh, ah, so yes, you, yes. You, yeah. Um, my own sense personally, again, it, it obviously depends on the level. Um, you know, if you're teaching a graduate course with PhD students, that's one thing. But since, again, this audience is largely focused on middle and high school students who presumably don't have a background in Soviet or Russian or Ukrainian studies and who may or may not have all that much of an interest in this particular area. Um, it seems to me that there are two things that are important to emphasize. I mean, and, and I do that with my own undergraduates. So they're a little older than those of, this, of the audience, but nevertheless, they're not that much older. Uh, one is I try to personalize it as much as possible. Uh, so it's, you know, yes, it's important to emphasize what Stalin was up to, to talk about collectivization, industrialization, Leninism, Stalinism, and all these other abstruse, abstruse notions. Uh, it's just that most students at most times, they tend to forget that. And if you provide too much of this academic detail, and you start talking about 4 million, 5 million, 6 million dead, and start talking about uh, obscure Ukrainian political or economic or church leaders, uh, it tends to go past them. Um, so what I have them do and what I would encourage people to consider is I ask them to write brief letters. Uh, they have to imagine themselves as being Ukrainian peasants in 1934, and they're writing a letter to their relative of some kind, in which they're describing what they experienced during the famine. And the point of that is I want them to get a sense of what it was like. And my belief is, again, I don't have the data for this, right? But my personal belief is based on my conversations with students, is that students are more likely to remember what they learned, that A, there was indeed this thing called a Holodomor, B, many, many people died horrible deaths, and somehow or other that wasn't their fault and it wasn't inevitable, it was somehow a policy issue, but that they will retain a knowledge of that by trying to imagine what it was like. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, kind of building off that, uh, it's difficult for high school students to understand how a famine could be perpetrated on such a large group of people. Uh, so you did mention the, you know, that you could discuss the, you know, mechanics of the famine. Uh, could, so could you give a brief explanation of how food was withheld? Okay, so we'll have to start in 1928-29, I'm afraid, but I will be brief. I'll be telegraphically so. Uh, Stalin adopts a policy called collectivization, whereby uh, private property of land by peasantry was supposed to be abolished, and each of their private plots were supposed to be put together into something called a collective farm. All of their animals were supposed to be put together into collective land holding and so on. All right. Uh, and the idea behind this was twofold. One is that it would presumably be more efficient. And two, it would be easier to control the peasantry because the peasantry were not communist. The peasantry wanted to retain private property. And as you know, private property is anathema to communists. Uh, so that was the idea behind this. Unsurprisingly, most peasants, not just in Ukraine, but also in Russia, Kazakhstan, all over the place, resisted. They didn't want to join. They were opposed. They oftentimes slaughtered their animals before giving them up to the collective farm. And the result of that, plus the party's determination to proceed full steam ahead, led to food shortages and mild forms of famine throughout many parts of the former Soviet Union. This is in 1931, 1932, early 1932. All right. 
And many of the people who deny that there is anything specific about the Ukrainian famine precise point this out. Namely, there was collectivization. All the peasantry, including Russians, hated it. Everybody opposed it, and many people died. That's absolutely true. In the case of Ukraine, the argument, the, 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 the uh, policies became even more intense. And that's why one talks about intent and genocide in the Ukrainian case. Because by mid-1932, as it was amply clear to the Ukrainian party leadership, which transmitted this in, uh, information to Moscow, it was amply clear to them that continued grain requisitions, they were taking grain from the peasantry, would result in massive famine. The central party authorities, instead of reducing the amount of grain the peasants had to provide to the state, increased the quotas. And they knew full well that this was going to intensify the famine and lead to more deaths, which is precisely what happened in December of 32 and January of 1933. And at that point, as peasants began desperately looking for alternatives, and one of the alternatives, of course, was to try to leave their villages for the cities and try to leave Ukraine. That, was, that made sense because right across the border from Ukraine, there was, the conditions were significantly better, precisely because the party had imposed very strict requisition requirements on the Ukrainian peasantry. But at precisely this point, the party seals off the villages, seals off Ukraine, thereby forcing people essentially to, well, to die, right? Providing the peasantry no escape. All right, so in a way, they converted all of Ukraine and the various villages within Ukraine into, if you like, the equivalent of Jewish ghettos, as in the Holocaust. Thank you. Um, so you did mention that, you know, for some people, there, you know, there's no smoking gun. Um, but one of our attendees asks, what about the law of August 7th, which forbade the stealing of five grains of wheat and made such a crime punishable by death. Uh, you know, is there not a like clear connection there in terms of intent? Well, clearly, you know, again, uh, that's part of the argument for intent. There was the law, that August law, the closing down of the borders, the increase of requisitions. If you look at uh, Soviet Party propaganda in the late 19 in late 1932, it adopts a very anti-Ukrainian tone. There is a crackdown on the on the party. There is a crackdown on the cultural intelligentsia. Hundreds of poets and writers and painters are sent off to Siberia, right? So if you look at that larger context, I mean, it seems pretty clear that Stalin and his henchmen had something against Ukraine and Ukrainians. Uh, you know, it's hard to say, well, no, everything was just perfectly neutral. But none of that amounts to that, quote, smoking gun, which would be, you know, decree number 725 issued by Stalin on December 1st, 1932, where he says, you must kill Ukrainians, right? Um, of course, by those standards, then one could also dispute the Holocaust because there, I mean, Hitler never issued that kind of order. Right. Um, but yeah, so of course, we know the Holocaust occurred. We know that it was a genocide. We know that it was planned. We know that they talked about this in all sorts of fashion. Uh, so a similar argumentation would then hold for the case of Ukraine. I mean, one infers intent from the almost overwhelming amount of evidence that suggests that the party wasn't acting serendipitously, um, but rather with a particular goal in mind. And they knew exactly what they were doing. Namely, they, were, they knew that this would cost lives and they were purposely intent on costing these lives precisely because it was an opportunity to get rid of the Ukrainian problem, right? Thank you. Yeah, it, it seems like an unreasonable demand to, to say that it, it hasn't happened unless Stalin wrote, go commit genocide. Um, now, the, these sorts of anti-Ukrainian policies, were they persistent throughout the entirety of Soviet rule in, in Ukraine, or, or were they just there uh, you know, the in the anti, 20s and 30s? 
in the early 19, late 19, from, starting roughly from 1918 to 1921, 22, the Soviet Russian party was very anti-Ukrainian in its behavior towards Ukraine, Ukrainians. Then in 1921, the Soviet party adopts a policy called nativization, essentially a kind of glorified affirmative action policy, plus they're tolerant of the peasantry. So for a period of roughly 1921-22 through about 1928, policies towards the non-Russians in general and Ukrainians in particular are somewhere between benign and positive. And then the world ends in 1929, roughly 28, 29, with Stalin's consolidation of power. So you've got this massive crackdown in the early 30s that continues in one form or other through the 30s. There is the hiatus of World War II, a resumption of the crackdown in the 40s, and it continues until Stalin's death in 53. It's been calculated by demographers that Ukraine lost something like 17 million excess people in the period between 1914 and 1953. Obviously, that's about three to four million in World War I, another uh, five or six million in World War II, but that still means about four, five, six million to, well, essentially Stalin's policies. Things improved under Khrushchev and under Brezhnev when there was a rollback, things never got as bad as they were under Stalin, but the party throughout virtually, except for that period of five years in the 1920s, um, party policy towards Ukraine was always either genocidal or more often simply repressive. Thank you. Uh, taking a couple questions together, uh, what is your position on the Pulitzer granted to Walter Durante for the articles that he published uh, with the New York Times, which were essentially Soviet propaganda? Uh, should there be a price paid for the sake of truth and memory? And what are some of the most egregious examples of intellectual self-delusion you see today that feel similar to what happened in and around the Holodomor? Um, okay. Um, you know, technically, he didn't deserve the Pulitzer, obviously. Uh, certainly not for that kind of reporting. Um, I'm sort of, I mean, I, you know, people have insisted that he be, that the Pulitzer be retracted. Um, to me, the more important point is that he's been criticized and exposed. Um, and if those of you who've seen Agnieszka Holland's recent film, Mr. Jones, if you haven't, highly recommended. It does a wonderful job exposing Durante, but it also does a wonderful job revealing the horrors of the whole Demore in Ukraine. Um, I mean, so that film plus any number of journalistic and academic accounts have already gone, I mean, they've, they've essentially discredited Durante. He's no longer credible. Um, to my mind, whether he retains this prize posthumously or whether he loses it posthumously, um, I don't lose any particular sleep over this issue. The key issue was that he be discredited and he be revealed for what he was, and he has been. And I'm happy with that. And again, there was a second question. Uh, just asking about uh, you know, intellectual self-delusion oh, yes. today. Yes, well, I mean, one finds that amongst the so-called uh, Russia understanders, that sounds better in German, Russland versteher. Uh, there's a whole current of academics, intellectuals, in the United States, in Western Europe, and in other parts of the world, who have this inexplicable sympathy for Vladimir Putin, the dictator president of the Russian Federation. Uh, now again, he's not a communist. I certainly wouldn't call him a totalitarian, but he's obviously an authoritarian. He's obviously a dictator. And I've personally gone on record in a number of my writings suggesting that he actually qualifies as being termed a fascist. Um, he has all the characteristics and the system he built has all the characteristics of a classic fascist system. So why not call a spade a spade? And rather than talking about his system as being Putinism, why not just say it's fascism? <laughs> That's all it is. But in any case, so as you can see, I'm very critical of him. 
Um, and there's a fairly large group of academics, journalists, intellectuals in the United States and Europe that is critical. I would say that's probably even the consensus. I mean, the degree to which one is critical varies. I'm obviously on the very critical side. There are others who are critical, but less so than I. But there is also a contingent, um, less so in the US, more so in Europe, and most of all in Germany, uh, and hence the term Russland Versteher, Russia for, for uh, uh, understander, who argue that Putin, you got to understand this guy. Um, he's, yes, he may be dictatorial. Yes, he may be vicious. And yes, he may be engaging in assassinations. And yes, he's destroyed democracy. And yes, and yes, and yes. But you got to understand that that's basically what the Russians want. Right? The Russians aren't democratic. The Russians aren't really interested in human rights. Um, so in essence, Putin is just doing what the Russians want. Um, so you can blame Putin, but if you do, you should be blaming the Russians. Uh, so Putin comes out of this smelling not exactly like a rose, more like a carnation, but be that as it may, uh, he comes out as someone who's simply doing the handiwork of the Russian people. Um, and that sounds very much like what you found in the 1930s, sort of bending over backwards, explaining that, well, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Stalin, after all, yes, he's an authoritarian. Yes, he's a totalitarian, but that's kind of what the people need. He's building up a great Soviet Union, just as Putin is building up a great Russia, and so on and so forth. Um, I fundamentally disagree with the view that Russians are congenitally incapable of human rights and democracy. I truly, truly do not believe that. They've shown on many occasions that they're interested in democracy. Even recently, they've shown that. And I am absolutely persuaded that if and when they have the opportunity, that is to say, if and when Putin leaves the historical stage, many, very many Russians will assert that interest and will assert that they want some form of democracy. Maybe not, may not be our form, uh, but it neither will be Mussolini's or Hitler's or Stalin's. Thank you. Uh, so you've mentioned that there is a, there's been a change in the overall scholarship on the Holodomor. Uh, but that nevertheless, there still remains a divide between you know, some that want to say that it's genocide, that being the majority now, and then those that don't. Is that divide generational? And is there a ethnic component to it? Or more specifically, do we find many Russians engaged in Holodomor research? Ah, that's a good question. Um, it's, What's interesting about the academics, the scholars, the specialists, who insist that this was a genocide, is, as I think I may have mentioned, the fact that most of them are non-Ukrainian. Uh, again, that's, it shouldn't matter. <laughs> you know, one's ethnic origins shouldn't matter. One's point of view should be judged on its own merits, but alas, it does. Um, and the point is that very, you know, people ranging from Anne Applebaum to, uh, to, uh, to many others in France, Italy, and, and other places will argue that it was genocidal. Um, and of course, the fact that it's not, th that they're, you know, that their claims are not based on their ethnic origins adds legitimacy to their particular argument, right? Um, I don't think it's generational per se. Um, well, to some degree. I mean, essentially, sort of, one could argue, and I think I'd like to argue, that it's the older generation that still retains these dubious or skeptical views, and the younger generation is largely on board. My guess is that's probably true, uh, although I think in, an ideological factor may play a role in this as well. Uh, it's not that people on the right will believe that this was a, whole, a, a genocide, but rather people on the left will be more inclined to disbelieve that it was a genocide. And that has something to do with residual sympathies for the Soviet Union and things like that. And you mentioned a very important factor, namely the Russian scholars. 
Um, and I would say it's not just Russian scholars in the so former Soviet Union in, Russian, in the Russian Federation, but also Russian scholars in the United States and Canada who are very, very skittish, very, very skeptical, um, and who either don't uh, investigate the Holodomor, or if they do, they do everything possible to subsume this under the larger category of collectivization and its tragedies, and they kind of downplay whatever particular Ukrainian dimension that it might have had. Um, again, whether they do this out of good faith or whether they're simply marching in step to uh, the propaganda signals being sent out by the Kremlin, I don't know. Uh, but that is generally the, the way in which many, if not most, Russians will perceive the Holodomor today. I'm fascinated personally by, the, by what will happen five or ten or however many years from now when Putin departs and Russians, I hope, embark on some kind of democratic path and they start reassessing their own past. Um, and my guess is they will start condemning Stalin rather more than they are today. And part of that condemnation will extend to a reassessment of the Holodomor. But of course, that's just a guess. Well, I, I hope that you're right uh, in your guess. Uh, are there any standout examples of resistance from peasants or others against the Soviets during the Holodomor? And specifically, do you have any information or insight into women's resistance in Ukraine? Uh, for instance, the Babsky Bunty. Right, right. Well, those starting in the late 20s, but extending into the early 30s, I mean, there were uh, thousands. I mean, this has been researched, something like thousands of well, local uprisings, uh, that encompasses everything from, you know, hitting somebody to actually drawing blood. But there were thousand, uh, thousands of acts of resistance across the entire Soviet Union to the policy of collectivization. Um, a very large number, a very large, indeed disproportionately large number, happened to be concentrated in Ukraine. And within these uprisings, uh, the so-called Babsky Abunte, the uh, women's uprisings, if you like, were very prominently displayed. Um, again, men did so as well, but certainly women were highly represented in this. And these, again, these uprisings isn't quite the right word because it suggests more of a massive form of resistance, but let's just call them acts of resistance. Uh, but these acts of resistance certainly were, uh, were, were certainly familiar, were known to the Soviet authorities. Um, and in as much as I suggested, a significant portion were located in Ukraine, that obviously enhanced the Soviet regime's view of Ukraine as a troublemaker. Um, because this wasn't the only time. Peasant resistance to the Soviet regime was especially intense in Ukraine in 1919-20, and then began petering out in 21, but continued in some form or other until about 1924, all right? So Ukrainian peasants didn't trust the Soviets. I mean, some of them obviously did, but a very significant proportion did not trust them, even in the good old days of the mid-1920s. And when you figure that 1924 is only four years from the initiation of collectivization, then it would follow that many people in the Soviet regime would have seen Ukrainian peasant resistance to Soviet rule as being something that is endemic in their very natures, if you like, and that had to be dealt with as quickly as, as, quickly and as effectively as possible. Thank you. Uh, do you believe there is a historic lingering trauma that the Holodomor has left for future generations? And do commemorations of such events serve to help build healthy national awareness or not? I mean, there's certainly been a trauma, obviously for the survivors, obviously for the children of the survivors, um, especially because it was only in the late 1980s that one could even acknowledge the existence of the Holodomor in Soviet Ukraine. So effectively for 50 more, 50 plus years, 
people had to live in a state not just of accepted denial, but they had to deny themselves that anything had taken place. And I can only begin to imagine how that must affect one's psyche and one's willingness to uh, engage in life, right? Um, there is another very important component here in terms of the trauma. This has been researched by a Ukrainian historian at the Institute of National Memory by the name of Vitaly Ohienko. Um, and he's done some very serious work using so social psychology sources, Western sources. And he's traced the stages by means of which one experiences starvation, namely denial, resistance, acceptance, and then eventually apathy. And then the next stage is the stage whereby, and this happened in Ukraine and starting in mid-33 and continued through mid-34, whereby as you are on the brink of death, the regime comes in and provides you with a few pieces of bread. And at that point, as he's researched, one becomes inexpressibly happy, inexpressibly grateful, and inexpressibly conformist. One essentially sort of adopts a kind of Pavlovian reaction and then simply becomes absolutely devoted to the regime which deigned to save you from imminent death, even though it was that regime that put you in that position in the first place. So that kind of behavior, that sort of conformism, that willingness not to resist, to say yes, that certainly remained a strong streak within Ukraine. I don't think it's as strong now as it was 40, 50, or even 30 years ago, because you have new generations, but it's still there. It's still part of the historical memory. In terms of commemorations, I, I'm, 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 on the one hand, I think they're good, because it's important for people to remember that these things happened, and one should not forget. On the other hand, I'm a little wary of, of some of them, um, not of them in and of themselves, but I'm a little afraid of Ukrainians developing a kind of victimization syndrome. Um, you know, yes, you need to recognize that terrible things happen to you in your history. And yes, that needs to be commemorated and remembered but know that should not form the core of your identity. I mean, your identity has to be more active. It has to be more proactive. And you can't simply transform yourself into a passive victim of history who's been downtrodden for hundreds or thousands of years. If that happens, you're no longer capable of emerging from that syndrome. You're, you're pretty much dooming yourself to passivity. Now, again, fortunately, Ukraine, I don't think Ukrainians have fallen into that, but it's always a potential possibility that one has to be careful of avoiding. Thank you. Uh, somewhat related, the Holodomor National Awareness Tour currently has a change.org petition to have the word Holodomor added to all major English dictionaries, which it, it currently is not included. Uh, how important are such efforts for Holodomor education? Well, again, honestly, um, I actually signed that petition. So I certainly, I have no problems. I wouldn't mind seeing the word listed in a dictionary. Um, how much would that affect Holodomor awareness or education? I don't know. Which is to say, I'm a little skeptical. Um, you know, yes, words matter, but they don't form the reality. I'm not one of these social constructivists who believes that language alone forms reality. I think reality has an objective quality to it. Words help us understand reality, but they don't form it. Um, so to my mind, it would be better for the whole Demur to be part of various curricula history curricula, if there are genocide curricula, things like that would make more of a difference. Uh, having, you know, it, were there to be museums with appropriate exhibits that would be understandable to kids, that might be more appropriate. Uh, personally, I'm somewhat skeptical as to the mega impact of adding a word to a dictionary. 
But as I said, I signed the petition. I support it. I'm not opposed to it. Um, I don't think it will have an earth shattering impact on the way the Holodomor is perceived. Thank you. Uh, last couple questions put together. Uh, you mentioned Mr. Jones, wonderful film. Um, are there any other films about the Holodomor that you would recommend for high school education? Uh, and could you also remind us of the author of the Speak of the Happy Life, uh, okay. the memoir that, that you mentioned that would be particularly helpful uh, for teachers? Uh, and then finally, you know, the, what would be the two, maybe three essential points that our educators here should be seeking to ensure that their students understand about the whole little more? Okay, so in, uh, first two questions. Um, there's many, you know, 30, 35 or so years ago, a documentary film was made called The Harvest of Despair. I believe that was the title. It's either Harvest of Despair or Harvest of Sorrow, but it's, in any case, The Harvest of Something. And it's a documentary about the whole Demore. Now, it was done about 35, 40 years ago, so it didn't quite have access to the same kind of archival research that has occurred in the last three decades, but it gets the story right. Um, it's about, I believe it's about 30 to 40 or so minutes, so it's, it's not too taxing in terms of attention spans. Um, and that would certainly provide the historical background and something like Mr. Jones does a nice job providing more of a dramatic immediacy to the Holodomor. Um, and I think that's probably more than sufficient. Now, there are a bunch of films that the Ukrainians have made in Ukrainian. And, you know, until they're dubbed or subtitled, I'm not sure that they are quite appropriate. Uh, but they're documentary films. Um, and as I said, they're useful, but the language would become a problem. Okay, so that would be the major recommendation I would make. In terms of the author of that particular memoir, uh, first name Anastasia, N-A-A-N-A-A, -A -A, excuse me, A-N-A, S-T-A-S-I-A, -A, last name Lisevets, L as in lady, Y as in yellow, S, Y, V as in Victor, E-T-S, Lisevets. Okay. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's a short read, but it's a very easy read and it's a very compelling read. Uh, ideal for the general public and certainly ideal for middle to high school students. In terms of the things that one should, you know, the, the, the major give, takeaway, um, let, me, let, me, let me suggest one. Um, I think the key to understanding any genocide, whether it's the Armenian or the Rwandan or the Cambodian or the Holocaust or the Holodomor, is to remember that this isn't necessary, it's not per se about Armenians and Jews and Ukrainians and Rwandas. Obviously it is, but it's not just. These are all deeply human tragedies. And it's the humanness, the humanity of these tragedies that makes them tragic, not just for Jews and Ukrainians and Armenians, but it makes them tragic for all of us. Um, you know, just as slavery is an issue for everybody in the world, just as uh, genocides and wars are issues for everybody in the world, so too the Holodomor as a particular example of a genocide, of a particularly nasty form of human behavior vis-a-vis -vis other humans, has to be remembered, commemorated, listened to, uh, learned from, not because Ukrainians are interesting or, 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 some, or deserve it. That's not the main reason. It's because Ukrainians are human beings, like everybody else. And it's the humanity, it's that common humanity that binds us. And to some degree that sounds trite, because we always talk about the common humanity, but I think in the case of genocides, you begin to see it at first glance. You begin to see that what could have happened what happened to them could have happened to me.
Right? And in some cases actually did happen to me, right? Depending on who you happen to be. So it's the humanity aspect is th that I would emphasize. Uh, that I, and, and that I actually do try to emphasize in my own courses. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank you for joining us and for your ongoing work to educate and to raise awareness of the Holodomor and, and to spell out the, the truth about it. I would like to remind our audience that you can follow Alex's work on his public Facebook page. And I want to thank all of you for attending today's program. You can find more information about our upcoming events, curricular resources, our witness project episodes, and other professional development opportunities for teachers at victimsofcommunism.org. You can also follow our work on Facebook and Twitter at VO Communism. For the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, I'm Murray Bassett. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.